boom. The shot echoed as the Taliban fired into the brain of a 15-year-old Pakistani schoolgirl, simply riding the school bus to school. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the name Malala Yousafzai. At only 15 years old, she started blogging for BBC about the difficulties of receiving an education under Taliban rule. And she was outspoken about the needs for women's rights and increased education for girls. The Taliban attempted to silence her, but all they did was draw more attention to her cause. Today, Malala has spoken to the UN about the importance of education and has even inspired the UN to start the Malala Fund in her honor to increase educational opportunities for girls. Around the world, millions of other girls simply yearn for the right to be heard, but health issues, poverty, and a lack of education prohibit them from achieving their dreams. The Global Poverty Project says, quote, we live in a world in which women living in poverty face gross inequalities and injustices from birth to death. From poor nutrition to poor education to vulnerable and low pay employment, the sequence of discrimination that a woman may face during her lifetime is unacceptable, but all too common. When families in third world countries suffer from poverty, it's the girls who are often the last to eat and the first to be kept home from school, according to care.org. When girls are cared for and educated, however, they can have a massive impact on their society and future generations. Today I'm going to be looking at the case for investing in girls. The problems girls and women suffer from in developing nations, what the global community is doing to solve these problems, and why it matters long term, through the three main areas in which we can empower women. Proper health care, a proper education, and the proper political recognition. Let's start by looking at the health issues that girls and women in developing nations face. Two of the prominent health issues are malnutrition and child marriage. Malnutrition is an issue for every continent and age group, but it specifically affects girls in many detrimental ways, stunting their growth and even lowering their IQ due to a lack of iodine. Child marriage is also extremely prominent among girls in the developing world. According to Time magazine, one in seven marries before she's 15. Child marriage can lead to death from intercourse and excruciatingly painful childbirth. Childbirth injuries, such as fistula, or related diseases such as HIV and AIDS. Perhaps most disturbing is that according to the UN Population Fund, the amount of girls giving birth under 15 is expected to double by 2030. The global community does nothing to change this. So what can be done to change this? Solutions for malnutrition include researching nutritional needs, treating severe cases, and planning for the future by providing provisions and planting guidance. Increasing the supply of vitamins and vaccines that the UN distributes to reach their goals of targeting HIV, AIDS, and malaria can also cure other diseases. Also, at the cost of a couple pennies per person, different nonprofits are iodizing salt, which can help unborn children gain up to 15 IQ points. And when it comes to child marriage, there are two main solutions. First, educating the parents at an early stage about how this could endanger their daughter. And secondly, if a marriage agreement is already underway, lawyers or various program representatives can intervene, educate the girl about her rights, and help put a legal end to the agreement. Governmental and non-governmental policies and programs must educate the community, raise awareness, engage local and religious leaders, involve parents, and empower girls through education and employment in order to stop child marriage, according to NCBI. Preventing child marriage does reduce birth injuries, but in cases where girls have been raped or are already suffering, they can undergo repair surgeries. Overall, by improving women's health will greatly improve societies, allowing women to lead longer lives and focus on other areas, such as their education. Also, reducing child marriage levels will mean that women will be stronger during the childbirth process, will be less likely to suffer from childbirth injuries, and can better care for their children. And an increased amount of infrastructure will mean that they will be able to more readily access medical care when a problem arises. By improving health, women will be able to be more active members of societies and will be better equipped to raise the next generation. Global women's rights activist Afshan Khan says, quote, the best way to save a child's life is to empower the mother. When you're suffering from a serious health issue, it's difficult to focus on anything else. 
but by helping girls to recover from these health issues, we'll open the doors for them to focus on other things. And something that millions of other girls around the world yearn for is education. And in many cases, it's simply out of their reach. Let's examine the roadblocks that are holding girls back from receiving an education in developing nations, and then address what's being done to solve these issues. And finally, we'll look at how increased education levels will improve societies. So what's prohibiting girls from receiving an education? Unaware of the opportunities a good education can unlock for their daughters, many parents will keep them home from school due to the cost, distance, or danger. In some cases, rural families value education, but there are no nearby schools. Time Magazine states, in Sub-Saharan Africa, fewer than one in five girls ever make it to secondary school. The problem specifically affects the girls in a family. Because, as mentioned earlier, during hard times, they're the first to stay home from school and to help the family, and may even be sold into prostitution out of desperation. This results in women accounting for two-thirds of the world's illiterate, according to the UN Population Fund. The first step in improving education has to do, again, with educating the parents about how educating their daughter can help her to lead a longer, healthier life, have higher income, and be more successful in general. Once the parents appreciate education, there's still a problem with the lack of infrastructure. Part of the UN's educational goals are to ensure everyone a primary education, which means building more schools and also sponsoring specific students who need financial assistance. Increasing the amount of girls who receive at least a primary education will have ripple effects throughout society. Similar to the effects of improving health, increased education will prepare women to have better families. Girls who have been educated are likely to marry later and to have smaller and healthier families. Educated women can recognize the importance of health care and know how to seek it for themselves and their children, according to the United Nations Population Fund, who also says education helps girls and women to know their rights and to gain confidence to claim them. And according to Reuters, at least 12 million children, a quarter of the world's malnourished population, could be saved from malnutrition if their mothers were given at least a secondary education. By convincing their parents and building more schools, we can empower girls through education and create a long-lasting impact on future generations. When we empower girls in the areas of health and education, then they're able to focus on using their voices to help themselves and other women through political empowerment. Laws regarding nearly every aspect of life have a massive impact on the safety and futures of girls. But women in developing nations receive very little political recognition. According to Time magazine, less than two cents of every development dollar goes to girls. And roughly nine of ten youth programs are aimed at boys. Add in the fact that only 19% of the world's parliamentarians are women, and we don't have a very balanced combination. Of course, I'm not blaming the current problems that women suffer from on men. In fact, a lot of educated men like David Cameron have helped to institute the UN's developmental goals and to empower a lot of girls through education. We definitely see a pattern, though, in developing nations of abusive male politicians who ignore or don't fully enforce women's rights. Without empowering women to stand up for themselves, the political scenes in these countries aren't going to change. So what can be done to empower women politically? The first step towards political empowerment is informing the women about their rights so that they can better uphold them. It's also important to help women use their education to support themselves. Programs such as Mercy Corps can provide women with microloans so that they can use basic skills to start their own business and provide for themselves and their families. Other important steps that can be taken include electing more female officials and politicians and encouraging women in third world countries to vote during elections, allowing them to use their voice to advocate policy decisions that will help them. Finally, let's examine the effects of empowering women politically. When more women own businesses, vote, and are elected, laws are enforced that are more sensitive to women's issues. Time reports, the World Food Program has found that when women and girls earn income, they reinvest 90% of it in their families. They buy books, medicine, bed nets. For men, that figure is more like 30 to 40%. In conclusion, the actions that are being taken by the United Nations and other development programs 
are going to make crucial change in the area of female empowerment. By tending to immediate health problems and preventing child marriage, girls can focus on their education and will be able to make healthier and wiser decisions for their children. And by building more schools and increasing attendance, girls will have better educations and will be able to use their minds to speak up for themselves politically, start their own businesses, vote, and elect more women in the political scene. According to Time Magazine, investment in girls' education may well be the highest return investment available in the developing world, Larry Summers wrote when he was a chief economist at the World Bank. Of such cycles, real revolutions are born. Today we've looked at the case for investing in girls. Women make up more than half of the world's population, and far too many suffer from deadly health issues, a lack of education, and few opportunities. Hopefully, as the UN and other programs focus on addressing these issues, we'll see the effects of empowering women through proper health care, a proper education, and the proper political recognition. We open with the story of powerful teen activist Malala Yousafzai. And I think it would be fitting to close with a quote from her. For my brothers, it was easy to think about the future. They could be anything they want. But for me, it was hard. And for that reason, I wanted to become educated and empower myself with knowledge. Let us remember one book, one pen, one child, and one teacher can change the world. Around the world, girls like Malala are full of potential, just waiting to be unlocked. And that is the case for investing in girls.